Alright. Well, I have started recording. Hello. And welcome. Oh. Oh. Big yawn. Uh, hi. Welcome back. Um. Just getting ready. Hmm. Okay, where the hell did it go? Oh, it's right there. Yes, hello and welcome back. Uh, last off, we left off where, uh, Miss Lexus had a very spooky encounter, uh, with her, her sister, where she, too, has been acting very strange. So, yes. Alrighty, so, oh, and then she got asked out by Carter, the one with the bright blue eyes, uh, to go to the dance, and she was just like, fine, I'll go, but only because I, I don't, what was it? Yeah, I'm not afraid of being seen with you. Yeah, I'll go out with you. Yeah, sure. Why not? In a sort of way. And now word has... Uh, uh, Lydia, her, I guess, friend, uh, has told her that her dad has been in an accident. So now we will see what is up with that. Okay. So, let me just gauge how much I want to read tonight. Okay. So. So this chapter is chapter 12. Wait, hold on. Hold on, sorry, I got distracted by something. Also, I don't usually get it, get like slurred words whenever I'm drinking, but I am drinking. Um, it's it's going to be mostly watered down by the time the final ice melts. But if I do mess up, just know it's because I have been drinking. And I only got, I only have like a glass of margarita. So, that's all that I've drank so far. Crunk. Hell yeah, man. I'm crunk. No, I felt the heat. The warmth of the the, the alcohol. Uh, I was playing some Overwatch. <laughs> oh my god. 
I was getting heated both physically by the alcohol and physically and emotionally because the game sucked. But now I'm not, I'm not feeling so heated physically because of the, the alcohol. But just know, if I do mess up, it's because I have been drinking. But I do mess up just regular sober me, so who knows? <laughs> Alright. So, yeah, chapter 12. I felt like time had hiccuped forward two seconds and left me behind. Carter grabbed my hand, and I vaguely noticed that he pulled me through the courtyard. Lydia was on the other side of me, like a yappy dog nipping at my heels. Don't you know anything else? He asked her, sounding, sounded ir uh, sounding irritated. They just told me to find Alexis, she protested. They kept paging her, but she didn't answer. The P, the PA, some, yeah, the PA system in the library must have broken, uh, Carter said. We didn't hear. In the front office, Mrs. Ames came forward to meet us. She did a double take when she saw Carter holding my hand. Then she put her hand on my shoulder. Your father is okay, she said. He's at St. Margaret's Hospital, and he's going to be all right. Hearing that melted the steel rod that had been holding me up. I felt my legs go weak. If Carter hadn't chose the exact moment to squeeze my hand, I might have passed out. Where's my mom? I asked. What about my, what about my little sister? Your mother is at the hospital already, and your neighbor Mary Fuller is picking you and your sister up to drive you over there, Mrs. Ames said. I can drive her to the hospital, Carter offered. I'm afraid that's not permissible, Carter, she replied. But thank you for offering. Alexis, come and sit down for a minute. Uh, sit down? Who could sit down at a time like this? I know this is weird, but I felt like if I stopped panicking or worried... Oh, yeah, but if I... F I know this is weird, but... It I felt like if I stopped panicking or worrying for a second, something terrible would happen, and it would be my fault. I looked up at Carter, my brain loading up another round of frantic questions. You really should sit down, he said. I was outnumbered. We followed Mrs. Ames into her office, and I sank onto my usual spot in her, on her sofa. What happened? I asked. You called. Tell me what happened. Mrs. Ames looked directly in, into my eyes. Your mother called. Your father was in an automobile accident and he's in the hospital, but he's okay. It's important that you go and be with your family, but it's not because this is a life or death situation. Do you understand? So that meant I should act like a grown-up, right? Yeah, so that meant I should act like a grown-up. Uh, right? You don't need to worry, she repeated in her principal voice. She sat down at her she sat down at her desk. Her brown hair fell to her shoulders in soft waves that began together but went in all directions as they brushed as they brushed her Surrey Eagle sweatshirt. It was the hair of a woman with no time to blow dry. Mom would cut off a toe before she, le before she left the house so with hair like that. It's okay, Carter said. Your dad will be fine. I nodded. Nodding was easy. Things on the outside were easy, but inside I was a complete wreck. I didn't know what to feel. I mean, I didn't even really like my dad, but I didn't want him dead. Or even her. I felt something in me slide, 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 like I'd been standing on a hill watching all of this happening from to someone else, and slowly the ground was coming out from underneath me. The air seemed stuffy and unbearably hot. Can we go outside? I asked. Mrs. Fully 
Mrs. Fuller will need to come into the office and sign you out, Mrs. Ames said. But we can wait for the car out front if you want to. She does, uh, Carter said, standing. He did everything. He told Lydia, who'd been growing restless in the corner, to go back to class. He had the secretary bring me a glass of water. He carried my bag and made sure there were no ants on the bench where we sat down. And when we sat, he didn't say anything, just looked for the car. I was so glad he was there. The car finally pulled up. We found the second kind person in this book. I mean, okay, well, yeah, Casey's a, the kind person, too, but she's possessed, so we got two out of, like, ten so far. She's nice when she's not possessed. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I was so glad he was there. A car finally pulled up. It was our busy buddy, kindly old neighbor. Uh, yeah, it was our busy buddy, kindly old lady neighbor from across the street, Mary. She went inside with Mrs. Ames. Carter opened the door for me and handed me my bag. He, leaned, he leaned down and looked at Casey, who was slouched against the back, the back driver's side window, looking at us with wide eyes. Her arm was wrapped around her school bag as if it were a life preserver. Hi there, he said, and she raised her hand and waved weakly. Case, this is Carter, I said. Carter, this is Casey, my little sister. She goes to Surrey Middle. Nice to meet you, he said. Casey nodded, staring up at him a little dumbly. I hoped he didn't think she was slow or something. She was just in shock. Mary, ba uh, Mary came back out to the car, mercifully, mercifully silent. She's usually one of those people who can talk until you want to toss yourself off a bridge. Thanks, I told Carter. Thanks for... He shook his head. For a moment, I thought he might kiss me, but he just touched my forehead with his hand. It was a, it was a soft gesture, like a feather brushing over my skin. Call me, he said, scribbling his phone number on a torn, torn out page of a spiral notebook and thrusting it into my hand, especially if you need anything. Okay, I said still reeling from his touch. Carter closed the door and the car pulled away. He's nice, Kay Casey said at last. Neither of us said another word during the entire drive to the hospital. Mom was inside, her purse slung heavily over her shoulder, chewing on her thumbnail and pacing back and forth across eight worn squares of linoleum. When she saw us, she came hurrying over and pulled us into a hug. Your father's fine, she said. He needs medical treatment, but he'll be okay. Casey pulled away and looked at Mom with glassy eyes. What happened? She, she asked. Mom took a deep breath. He was on his way to work, and something went wrong with the car. He veered off the side of the road and hit a tree, but he wasn't going very fast. She pulled her hair, yeah, she pushed her hair back off her face. Luckily, he wasn't going uphill. So he's okay? Yeah, so he's okay? Casey asked. Yes, he's probably got a broken leg and some broken ribs and some other internal problems. That's, that's huge. I mean, that's not dead, but that's still... That's still a pretty big thing to happen.
I mean, yeah, he didn't die or he's not, like, in a coma, but that's still a broken leg and then some broken ribs and other internal problems. Mm-hmm. That sounds like some, some big, some big, big issues right there. Yeah, running into anything is serious. Even if you hit a tree at like 10 miles per hour, that's still pretty fucking fast. And the blow, that blow is going to be pretty fucking hard. I mean, I get that maybe he was using his brakes and stuff, but like, still, if you're doing, I don't know, Broken leg and some broken ribs and other internal problems sound very, very, very concerning. But he'll be okay, it says the book. Yeah, yes, he's probably got a broken leg and some broken ribs and some other internal problems. She had a Casey shoulder. But yes, he's okay, thank God. Mom went out... And then, yeah, mom went on about physical therapy and cuts and scratches and medical stuff. I sat down on a smooth plastic chair and wrapped my hands around the, mint, around the metal armrests. They felt cold and clean and solid on my skin. I've never been in an emergency room before. It was a lot like the ones on TV. The linoleum floor shown under the buzzing fluorescent lights. Everything looked polished and sterile. Even the smells were disinfected. Sharp hints of alcohol and bleach. Sorry. Just need to take a swig of my watered down margarita. Yeah, even the smells were disinfected. Sharp hints of alcohol and bleach. As I sat there and watched the thick plastic hands of the clock turn, tick forward, my thoughts turned pessimistic. So what? Dad was going to have to stay home from work. So what? Dad was going to have to stay home from work? He would take care of him. How would we pay our bills? Were we just supposed to sit here and stare at the sick people coming in and out all day? Did people really do that? I felt nauseous and sticky and angry. I longed for the splinter I longed for the splintered cushions and exposed foam of the library sofa, the soft, sandy sound of Carter's voice. I remembered his fingers floating against my skin, and the thought made my my throat feel tight. The voices around us melted into a sickening murmur. I thought I might explode, but Casey broke first. I have to go outside, she said, standing up. I'll go with you, I said. Mom nodded vaguely. The sun made us both squint as we walked out through the double doors. Can we just go home? She asked. I wish, I said. We're supposed to be here for Dad. Casey stamped her foot on the sidewalk and let out a little grunt. If one of us was in the hospital, he wouldn't come, she said. Yes, he would, I said. I want to go home, she said. Wait, let me say that again. I feel like I said she said, like, okay, yeah. Let me just say that again. I feel like I said it wrong. If one of us was in the hospital, he wouldn't come, she said. Yes, he would, I said. I want to go home, she said. I know, Case, I sighed. Don't you? Sure, whatever. I didn't have the energy to be reassuring. Casey crossed her arms in front of her. I'll walk if Mom won't drive us, she said. Mom can't leave, I said. Then let's just go. Be realistic, I said. We have to ask. Wait here. I'll be right back.
Mom was deep in conversation with Mary, so she just nodded and waved, with, and waved me away. Mary started the story about her cousin who was killed in War, World War II. Anyone who's lived in our neighborhood more than three weeks has heard it like 40 times. It takes roughly 35 minutes to finish, start to finish, and she can modify it to fit any occasion. Birthdays, Christmas, Halloween. See you later, I said, and walked out before Mom could say no. I didn't want to be there any more than Casey did. And that is the end of that chapter. Oh, damn, this is a longer chapter. Nice. Oh, and this is a very long chapter. These two chapters are so long. Oh my god, I love it. Oh my god, and the next one is so long too. Ooh, I love it. Alright, so the next chapter is chapter 13. I might just get more margarita, though I'm not sure. Okay, yeah, chapter 13. The walk to the house, yeah, the walk to the house is far, almost two miles, and it was hot. The bright sun had already baked off any of the morning's autumn, of the morning's autumn coolness. Neither of us complained, though. We were too glad to be going home. We were hit by a we were hit by a blast of cool air when we passed through the front door. Mom gave us uh hold on. Yeah, we were hit by a yeah, we were hit by a blast of cool air when we passed through the front door. Mom must have let the air conditioner on when she left for work, which is like the worst sin you can commit in the West, in the Warren household. There were are there are starving children in Africa, and you have the nerve to leave the air conditioner running all day. I turned, I turned all the moony. <sighs> Excuse me. Uh, we turned all moony for a minute, dropping it. Yeah, we turned all moony for a minute, dropped our bags in the front hall, held our arms out, and spun in slow circles under the vents. Heavenly. Casey shook her, ha Casey shook her hair wildly. I checked my watch. It was only 10.30, and I felt like I'd lived at least a full day's worth of excitement. I think I'll take a nap or something, uh, Casey said. I didn't sleep so great last night. That made two of us. She headed upstairs and I flipped the air conditioner power to off, then went to the living room and sank into Dad's recliner. If I closed my eyes and concentrated, I could smell the lingering aroma of his aftershave. I thought about him, alone in this room at the hospital. Did he feel lonely and sorry and... Did he feel lonely and sorry, unloved? What if he died and that chair was the only thing we had left that smelled like him? I breathed in again, but couldn't pick up the scent. And guilt flooded over me and left me feeling empty and scared and horribly selfish. But as I reclined into the overstuffed chair, I... Yeah, but as I reclined in the overstuffed chair, my relief was overwhelming. We would rest now and walk back to the hospital later, when it was cooler and the sunlight wasn't harsh and colorless and raw. The light breeze would be blowing, and we would stop at the grocery store on the way and buy flowers. Gradually, a dream floated in and took over. The little girl in the fancy dress, the one for my story. She's backed into a corner crying. A crowd of kids has gathered around her, and I am one of the crowd. We have planned for this week now, since the day we saw her wandering through the graveyard with her doll, and Mildred told us that there was a sure. 
And Mildred told us that was a sure sign and she was a witch. We can't have a witch in our town. We close in. The girl pitches through the group and runs. We run after her, shouting war cries down an empty road. Our feet, our feet pound against packed dirt, sending up clouds of dust. We run for a long time. Finally, a house comes into view. My house. But it's not my house in this dream. The little girl is scrambling up the oak tree. Uh, yeah, the little girl is scrambling up the oak tree. Desperately hauling herself from branch to branch, trying to reach the open window on the second story of the house. I don't want to do this, but I can't stop myself. I reach down and scoop up a pebble from the ground. My hand reaches back, then sends it flying up at her. Cuckoo! Yeah, cuckoo! Or cuckoo. Or cuckoo. I think it's cuckoo, but it could be cuckoo too. Cuckoo! The girls are shouting. Climb your tree, cuckoo bird. Fly away, cuckoo. The girl in the tree wails as she climbs higher and higher. Gradually, the constant stream of pebbles slows. The game isn't fun anymore. But then the biggest girl says, Scare away the cuckoo bird. Yeah, scare away the cuckoo bird and, and drops one last pebble into my hand. I take aim and throw it. It hits the girl's hand just as, he, as she reaches for another branch. And she falls. A long, long fall. She hits the ground and lies horribly still, and time seems seems to grind to a halt. No one says a word. Go! Go, Patience! The big girl says. Go wake her up! I don't want to. You threw the last one, someone says. They are all urging me... Yeah, they are all urging me on now, scolding me and telling me it's my fault. I take a step toward the body on the ground. Surely she's only sleeping. Yeah, surely she's only sleeping? Sarah, I say. I go closer and walk around her to see her eyes. They are wide open. A trickle of blood drips from the side of her gaping lips. She is dead. Next to her is the precious doll, whose hair is still cr clutched in Sarah's hand. I step closer, and suddenly the eyes, the and suddenly the doll's eyes pop open, bright green and glowing. I woke with a breathless cough and looked at the clock, twelve thirty. I had been asleep for two hours, and the air conditioner had been blasting the entire time. The house is so cold, I could practically see a ghost dream. Yeah, ghost dream. Okay, yeah, I'd been asleep for two hours, and the air conditioner had been blasting the entire time. The house was so cold, I practically, I could practically see my breath. I turned to her, I hurried to turn off the air conditioner. <sighs> Goosebumps erupting on my arms. Problem? I turned it off two hours ago. Still groggy from my nap, I stood and stared at the thermostat. Hoping something would happen. Nothing. Of course. Great. Now the air conditioner was wonky. Mom and Dad would assume that Casey and I turned it on when we got home and somehow broke it. I pried the plastic cover away. The little blue arm stood at 75, but the, therm but the thermometer read 54 degrees. So even if it wasn't off, it wasn't supposed to be running. The cold was unbearable. I sat upstairs and peered through Casey's bedroom door. She was asleep. 
little puffs of foggy breath escaping from her mouth. It was too cold for just a t-shirt. The doll seemed to stare in disapproval. Yeah, the doll seemed to stare in disapproval, and I knew if Case woke up, she'd probably flip out and spend the next six months paranoid that I was going to mess with her stuff when I wasn't looking, or when she wasn't looking. But the last thing we needed was for her to get a horrible flu from sleeping in freezing cold. I just went as far as the closet to get a blanket. The shelves in my sister's closet like the rest of her bedroom were an absolute disaster. Books, jewelry, shoes, magazines, her old Snoopy phone that had turned yellow with age, all piled on top of one another. The pink blanket she used in the winter rested on the bottom shelf with her backpack leaning up against it. As I pulled on the blanket, the backpack tipped over, spilling out a fan of multicolored folders. I reached down to gather them when I caught a glimpse of one of the covers. My Ancestors, it read, by Mimi Laird. I looked at the next one. My Ancestors, Men Benji Byerson. My Ancestors, Jenny Lynn Wu. My Ancestors, Evan Litchfield. What are you doing? The voice scared me so much that I dropped the stack of reports. I just stared at her. I came in to cover you up, but why do you have everyone else's projects? She gave me a look that pretty much plainly, uh, sh yeah, she gave me a look that said pretty plainly that she didn't think it was my business. I'm a student grader, she said at last. A what? It's new. Yeah, it's new. Uh, Casey yawned and scooted up to the edge of the bed. Don't bother with the blanket. I'm awake. She followed my gaze to the papers on the floor. I'll get those later, she said. I was kind of surprised she hadn't wigged out about me being so close to her dolls without supervision. But she didn't look anywhere near freaking out. And if she wasn't going to freak out, I wasn't going to either. There's something wrong with the thermostat. Yeah, there's something wrong with the thermostat. Come help me check out the circuit breaker, I said. Casey followed me downstairs and into the garage. The cold had seeped under the kitchen door, and even the garage was chilly. If Mom showed up now, we'd be grounded into college. How long would it take to warm up the house if we opened all the windows? Yeah, how long would it take to warm up the house if we opened up, if we opened all the windows? Then mom would never know, until the electric bill showed up. Built into the wall behind the garage door was a metal cabinet. Opening it revealed about 30 chunky black switches. Casey leaned in to look at them. What are those? Fuses, I said. Which one is for the air conditioner? Uh, Casey asked. I studied the little map on the top of the cabinet. Third down on the left, little square labeled AC. This one, I said, flipping the switch. Go see if that worked. Casey ran inside. A second later, she came huffing and puffing back. Nope, she panicked. I stared at the rest of the circuits. Okay, I said. Stay here and flip the switch light when I tell you to. I went inside to the thermostat and looked at the little red light in the corner. Flip it, I called. The red light went dark. Flip it back, I called. The light, the light came back on. Then off, then on, then off, and on again. But none of that mattered. Because the whole time... The air never stopped blowing through the vent. Casey came in from the garage, shivering. No luck? No, I said, my, cheek, my teeth chattering. We're going to get in so much trouble. So what else is new? 
Casey said. She approached the thermostat and grabbed the switch, moving it back and forth. I almost told her to stop because I was afraid the stupid thing would break off. I'm freezing, uh, Casey said under her breath. Turn off! Turn off! Mid-flip, the air conditioner turned off. We stood in silence. We stood in confused silence. Huh? I said. Weird. I didn't do anything. Casey snapped. Did I say you did? I, I, I asked, going back into the kitchen. Jeez. She stomped up the stairs, leaving me alone. I pulled a string cheese and a few pieces of sliced turkey out of the fridge and stood in the kitchen eating, just kind of looking around. I looked at the garage door and then down at the floor. The gray light rug rag, uh, the light gray rag rug with, had dark smudges on it. Footprints. I lifted my foot and looked at the bath. Yeah, I lifted my foot and looked at the bottom of my sock. It was covered in a fine dust. It was covered in a fine dusting of grimy looking dirt. Just like the dirt I'd seen on Casey's stock the, that morning. So she'd been in the garage at 6.30 in the morning. Why? The contact sheet from my earlier, yeah, the contact sheet from my earlier darkroom session was completely dry. I counted down to the fifth row of neg negatives and over three to the half ruined, half in focus picture. I put the negative into a little frame, checked the focus, then set a piece of photo paper down and hit the timer. <sighs> After 15 seconds, I slipped the paper into the developer and stood back to watch the image emerge. But there wasn't an image, unless the whole paper immediately turning black counts as an image. I pulled that page out and rinsed it clean before dropping it into the before dropping it in the trash. I set another piece of paper down and turned the timer on for five seconds, figuring it might have under figuring it might have it might be underexposed, but at least I would have a better idea of what time to use. But no, this one turned black too. A panicky feeling started to rise up inside me as I looked at the package of voter paper. There were two black plastic bags of 50 sheets each. Only the top one should have been unsealed, but they were both open. Ghost pictures. Ooh. Of the ghost AC? Of the ghost AC? What's AC mean? The ghost air conditioner? Oh. You should have put a slash between that. It's just like, AC? What does that stand for? Yeah, AC. The air conditioner ghost. But yeah, a panic of feeling started to rise up inside me as I looked at the package of photo paper. There were two black plastic bags with 50 sheets each. Only the top one should have been unsealed, but they were both open and the stacks of paper weren't neat and even. They were irregular and off center. All of my paper had been exposed. A package like this cost $60. With my current weekly allowance of $20, that meant three weeks of savings down the drain and three weeks of more savings before I could even afford another package. Three weeks without developing photos? I started to feel sick. I started to feel kind of sick. I told my sister a trillion times not to touch my stuff, not to even go in the dark room, and she refused to listen. Casey was guilty. She had to be. 
After a few deep breaths, I went to confront my sister. My hand shook as I walked down the hall and pounded on her door. Stay calm, I told myself. Be mature. She opened it, blue eyes wide. What? She asked. I took a long breath through my mouth. I took a long breath through my nose. Just tell, just tell me why, huh? My calm exterior shattered like a light bulb dropped from a third floor window. Why did you do it, Casey? What did I do to you? I tried so hard to be nice to you when nobody even wants to be your friend, and you... Her hands flew up to her cheeks, which flushed pink. Lexi! She cried, dismayed. I took a step back. Why, Casey? I didn't do anything, she said. I swear I didn't. I don't even know what happened. I heard a noise, and then all I remember is having a, the weirdest dream, and then I was at school, and they said to come to the office because Dad and because of Dad, and I saw all the reports on on Miss Lewin's desk, and later they were in my bag. What? What? Her face fell slack, her jaw hanging slightly open, her breath ragged. What are you talking about, Case? She shook her head and stared at the floor. I'm talking about... I'm talking about my photo paper. Yeah, I'm talking about my photo paper. Someone ruined it. All of it. It wasn't me, she said in a tiny voice. But wait, you stole those reports from school? I thought you said you were a student grader. No, she wailed. I told you I didn't. I mean, I guess I took them, but I didn't mean to. I just looked in my bag and found them there. You're saying someone framed you? I asked. I don't know. I guess so. Ghost reports. <laughs> ghost reports. <laughs> oh, man. This ghost stuff is getting way out of control. Knowing how spiteful kids could be, it was a serious possibility. Did you see anyone near your bag? Yeah, did you see anyone near your bag? I don't know, she said. My patience was paper thin. Casey, either you did or you didn't. Maybe, she said. I mean, I don't remember, but it had to be someone, right? Someone. More like Mimi Laird or one of her snotty little friends. I didn't say it out loud, though, because Casey seemed traumatized enough. I sighed. You're going to have to give them back. I can't, she wailed. I'll get expelled. Teachers understand mean kids' case, they said. You just have to do it soon or so it doesn't look any weirder. Will you help me? I'm tired, she said pitifully. I didn't sleep very much last night. I had... I didn't point out that she'd just taken a two-hour power nap. I uh, thought it occurred to me. Yeah, so why were you in the garage this morning? Her nose wrinkled. I wasn't in the garage. When I saw you in the hall, your socks were dirty, I began. In the hall? She asked. I didn't see you in the hall this morning. I stared at her. What are you talking about, Lexi? I don't understand. I didn't understand either, but I did understand that all these bizarre things were starting to add up and made me feel like I was going crazy. After all, what was that old saying? The common link between all your problems is you? What if I was losing it? I'm going for a walk, I said, going into my room to get my house key. Can I come? No. I said, I just want to be by myself for a while. No fair, she whined. Ghost sucks. <laughs> oh, 
Oh man. No fair, she whined. You just stay here, they said, and try to figure out how you're going to explain to your teacher that you stole everybody's reports. I didn't, she yelled. I didn't steal anything. Someone put them in my bag. And then she ran into her room and slammed the door. At least she wasn't insisting on coming. I went downstairs and out the front door, locking it as I left. Out of guilt, I glanced up at Casey's windows to see if she was looking down at me. She was. I pulled my eyes away from her and glanced at the oak tree, trying to put its horrible role in my dream. That's when I noticed the lines of wood, the jagged edges <coughs> <coughs> That's when I noticed the lines of wood of the wood, the jagged edges of long since removed limbs, the soft overgrowth of bark on several of the scars left behind by pruning or broken branches. The tree I'd drawn the night before. It was this tree, this exact tree, down to a tuft of grass growing out of a tiny hollow about six feet off the ground. I had to get out of there, but I could, but I could think of only one place to go. Uh, I hurried down the front walk toward the street. By the time I reached the school, most of the parking lot was empty. A few stragglers stood by their cars in small groups, talking. A group of kids waited miserably at the bus loop for their late bus. At the side of the brick building, my body tensed, the way it does at 7.58 every weekday morning. And, but it was better than being surrounded by things that made me feel like I was coming completely undone. <clears throat> One girl looked at me strangely. When I walked past her, she moved forward like she was going to say something, but a friend touched her arm and they both turned away. As I passed the gym, a mob of cheerleaders emerged from the band room and went by me, chatting like first graders at a crosswalk. They weren't wearing their uniforms, but their white ribboned ponytail... <clears throat> yeah, they weren't wearing uniforms, but their white ribboned ponytails and pack-like formation gave them away. A couple of them looked at me and whispered, heads bowed together like horses nuzzling. Megan Wiley was the last to exit. She carried a notebook and studied the papers inside it, so intently that she almost wrecked, that she almost walked right into me. Sorry, she muttered, and then looked up. When she saw me, she had an involuntary she took an involuntary step backward, step backward, uh, step backward. <clears throat> yeah, when she saw me, she took an involuntary step backward. I averted my eyes, waiting for her to make a quick retreat into the gym after her minions, but she didn't. Instead, when I glanced up, she was looking at me. How's your dad? She said. The question was beyond unexpected. Um, all right. Lydia told everyone you fainted, she said, with a shudder, and she, with a shudder she added. Then she said your dad was probably going to die. I rolled my eyes and shook my head. For some reason, my mouth felt like it was full of straw. He's okay, I said. Just broken bones, bruised organs, Limbs, rim, limbs, ribs, that kind of thing. The conversation could have ended there, but Megan swallowed hard. I just... My mom died in a car accident when I was a baby, she said. So I was really worried. Wow. Wow, I said. What else could I say? The things you don't know about people. I'm sorry. Well... I don't remember her so. Still, I said. Yikes. I live with my grandmother, she said, 
and then her eyes flickered longingly toward the door where all of her friends had gone. But thanks for asking, I said. But I'm glad she, I'm glad she's okay. No, it was he. No, it was he. It's my dad, I said. She blushed, her perfect cheeks turning a lovely rose color. I mean, I knew that. S sorry. Well. Yeah, so many people just getting real real with Lexi today. And she's just like, um, I don't know how to feel about this. So many people with actual trauma, man. I didn't know they existed. I thought I was the only one with trauma. Try to kill myself. My mom died when I was young. My sister is possessed by a ghost. Yep. Yep, that's how her day is going so far. Well, I said, wishing for a sinkhole or something to swallow me up. We stood there, up to our ankles in awkwardness. Rough day, Lexi. Yeah, it's been a rough day for Lexi. Well, I said, wishing for a sinkhole or something to swallow me up. We stood there, up to our ankles in awkwardness. Thanks, I said at last. She smiled a tight-lipped smile, and I and ducked into the gym. Huh? I stood there for a second. Then, without the warning... Then without warning, the door opened, and Megan stuck her head out. If you're looking for Carter Bloom, I saw him talking to Mr. Makeley about five minutes ago, she said. My expression was apparently so shocked that it was funny, because Megan laughed. It was a short, self-conscious laugh, but it wasn't meant but it wasn't mean or anything. See you, she said and disappeared. This time I hurried away so she wouldn't surprise she couldn't surprise me again. Mr. Makeley stood outside the library for twenty minutes after school after school ended every day. I'd probably have I'd probably have him for physics next year. Yeah, I'd probably have him for physics next year. He gave me a strange look as I entered the courtyard, and I got this weird, uncomfortable feeling that everyone thought my dad was dead. It made my heart beat funny for a second just to think about it. Carter wasn't there, so I headed toward the student parking lot. When I got there, the first thing I saw was Carter in his car, studying his iPod. I stopped suddenly as it hit me. What am I doing? Why had I run straight to Carter? I hardly even knew him, and here I was, following him around after school like a lovesick loser. The skin around my jaw and ears felt tight, and my eyes started to burn. I wondered how fast I could get someplace else, just somewhere he wouldn't see me as he drove away. I scanned the parking lot and saw only shrubs and a few cars that were all too far away to dash for. I had no choice but to stand there and wait for him to notice me. He did a double, he did a double take, and then... Yeah, I had no choice but to stand there and wait for him to notice me. He did a double take, then got out of the car and walked over. Hi, he said, his voice a question. I looked at him and the wanting to crawl under a rock and die feeling intensified. How's your dad? He's okay. Carter looked at me. 
how are you? Amazing how suddenly there was no easy answer to that question. I'm fine, I said. He just looked at me and shook his head. No, you're not. That made me laugh, but laughing made tears spring to my eyes. I know, I said. He didn't say anything else. He held his hand out like I should take it. I don't understand, he said. I think I'm losing my mind. He looked at the sky and then at the ground. I understand, he said. And then I was engulfed in his arms and a smell, laundry detergent and shampoo and all that was clean. I closed my eyes and leaned against him and let everything go. And that is the end of that chapter. Aw, oh, she's in love. She is in love you with this heart horror. It's funny, uh, ew woo. Ew woo. It's funny because me and Chandler have a friend named Carter, so it's not like every time I read this I think of him. And like every time I read the name in the book that I think of him, but I'm just like, well, Carter, that's Carter. But Carter has brown eyes. He does not have blue eyes. Oh, and you knew a girl named Alexis. And I have a coworker named Alexa, so. Ghost connection. Oh my god, totally. Totally ghost connections. Okay. Alright, on to the next chapter, which is chapter 14. Chapter 14. He twirled a twig between his finger and thumb. First of all, he said slowly, I've known crazy people, and I don't think you're crazy. Then he sat up straighter. I mean, your sister sounds like she's got some issues, but I don't see it in you. But I just don't see it in you. Maybe I'm the secret kind of crazy, I said softly. The kind where you keep it to yourself and then one day you just go off the deep end. Carter took a deep breath. I don't think you need to worry about that. What do you mean? Yeah, what do you mean? He sighed and tossed the twig away. It landed in the water with a soft splash. We were sitting in the grass near the drainage canal at the park, which isn't as ugly as it sounds. It's more like a little bubbling, bubbling brook. You're, you're strong. Strong people can't be crazy? He smirked and ducked his head. Strong people will just go off the deep end one day. That to tw Uh, let me say that again. Strong people just don't go off the deep end one day. That, tor that territory belongs to the weak. Oh. I think you're being too hard on yourself, I said. He shook his head, but didn't look at me. Sometimes life really blows, I said. Yeah, Carter said. Sometimes it does for everybody and most people can cope, but not. He sucked in air through his teeth and stared into the sun. Not me. But why beat yourself up? Who cares if you, I mean, you could possibly dislike someone just for going through something like you can say it, Alexis. It was a suicide attempt. He looked right into my eyes and then cocked his head to one side. A botched one. I turned back to the water and worked on braiding pine needles together. But finally my curiosity got the better of me. Uh, okay. Here's 
I don't, I still don't remember what happened to the book, because I read it a long time ago, but I see that we're getting into, you know, uh, a lot of trigger, triggering, um, things, issues in this book. Well, not issue. well, yes, issues in this book. So, um, trigger warning, you know, suicide, uh, uh, self-mutilation, stuff like that. Be, this is your warning. Do not uh, listen to this if you are dealing with this and you have trouble coping with stuff like this. Trigger warning all the way. I don't know how in detail this book gets. I totally forget how much in detail this, this book gets. But there just you're just we were just warned trigger warning trigger warning trigger warning all the way all the way okay and just you know existential crisis that may, you know, trigger your existential crisis and just like, you know, get into things that most people do not. You got a little girl that fell off the and broke. It's like it's trigger warning for that. Yeah, but that's like, okay, yeah. Trigger warning for that too, even though it already passed. To people that may have lost loved ones in that form who fell out of, of a tree. Trigger warning for this chapter, or for this segment in this chapter, because I can already feel it starting to go to go like one in one direction right now. She must have been a witch, a witch. But yeah, she must have been a good girl because she died. But now she's wreaking havoc on the present day people. And now she's a ghost doll. Yeah, now she's a ghost doll. Oh, I should have also said trigger warning to people that don't like dolls just because they're creepy i mean that's yeah if you're afraid of like ghost dolls or scary stories show your warning do not listen to it because <laughs> doll dolls are creepy like the the collectible dolls those like weird ones with the weird eyes those are creepy Okay, but yes, I turned back to the water and worked on braiding pine needles together, but finally my curiosity got the better of me. What do you do? He lay back in the grass, keeping a wary eye on me, like a shy dog. Never mind, I said, sorry, not my business. Don't be sorry. I'm just not used to talking about it. He held his arm out to me. Ever wonder why I only wear long sleeves? I took his forearm I took his forearm in my hands and pushed his sleeve back, revealing a crisscrossed etching of scars. My mom came back home early from the conference and found me, he said. We had to redo the tile in the bathroom because the blood stains wouldn't come out. Without thinking about it, I hugged his arm close to me. 
A second later, I realized what I was doing and dropped it like a hot potato. He laughed, the slow, easy laugh. The Carter laugh. I just couldn't see how someone so graceful, so clever, clever could ever be so depressed. I looked down at the ditch and sighed. How can you be so perfect all the time? I said without thinking. Carter looked at me in surprise and took a second to answer. Perfect? He repeated. Huh. I didn't say anything. I was paralyzed by a regretful shock over what I'd just said. Miss Varen, uh, he said in a... Oh, okay. Miss Varen, he said in a German psychiatric accent. I'm afraid you are delusional. I hope that was good enough, because I'm not going to do it again, because I feel like that sounded pretty good. Delusional? I repeated. It sounded about right, given the events of the past day. But I pushed out, but I pushed that out of my mind and concentrated on Carter. The fact that he hadn't laughed in my face helped made me bolder. So then, what are your flaws? What are my flaws? I have a list of them. I have to list them. He laughed ruefully and shook his head. That's hardly fair. What are your flaws? In case you haven't noticed, my whole existence in is one big flaw, I said, lying back on the grass next to him and staring up at the sky. I am a giant pimple on the face of humanity. That's kind of gross, he answered. At least I'm honest. That's not honest, he said. That's paranoid and... He thought for a second. Very pessimistic. Paranoid, pessimistic, I said, ticking them off on my fingers. And gross, that's three. The tip of my flaw iceberg. I'm not calling you paranoid. I'm not calling you paranoid. Just the things I say? He batted at my arm. Maybe you are crazy, he said, but his tiny smile made my whole body tingle. Flaws, I said, all business. Yours, list them. I'm a snob? I'm a snob, he said easily. About what? Oh, lots of things. Movies, books, school plays, people from the country. Which country? The country. Like farmers? He wrinkled his nose. I don't even know why. Oh, duh. Alexis's flaw... Alexis's flaw number four. Stupid. What else? Yeah, what else? He hesitated. I don't get along with my father, he said. I could understand that one. I stared at a fluffy white cloud, uh, waiting for a shape to pop out at me. I spend too much time thinking about myself, I blow things out of proportion, I have done very selfish things, and I'm not brave. He squinted into the sunlight and gave me a wry, a wry smile. Stop! I turned my eyes away from what could have been, from what could have been a cloud alligator to look at Carter. Somehow during our conversation, we had moved toward each other. Our arms were touching. My skin felt electric. There was definitely more to Carter than his preppy exterior. There was... Yeah. I hope you don't really see yourself that way, I said. He turned to look... He turned to look at me and narrowed his eyes. How do you see me? He said softly. I gave him a gentle shove. You don't want to know. Yeah, you don't want to know. He waited. I think you're... 
my voice went nearly silent. Dangerous. Why? He whispered. Because, I said, though I had no idea how to put it in words. You make me think too much. And now, now he had his whole, now he had turned his whole body to face me. I've never met anyone like you. I felt an urgent, mo almost magnetic pull between us. and made my throat feel dry and airy. This is so weird, I said, but it came out as a whisper. He stared, me, he stared at my face for a moment and then smiled. Oh God, was it obvious that my heart was pounding? It was like those scenes in movies where the girl thinks the guy is going to kiss her, so she closes her eyes and puckers up. Except I wasn't just puckering my lips. I was puckering my whole soul. I can't help it, Alexis, he said. I want to make you think too much. And then I want to hear the things you've been thinking too much. I was lying down, but that made me dizzy. This was all too much. I felt my I felt myself start to blush. So I raised my so I raised my arm, intending to cover my face. God, this is why I love this book so much. It was just like, oh my god, oh Carter. Oh, oh. <laughs> I remember now. I remember reading like this part. I was just like, oh my god, so dreamy, so dreamy. Man, but I was a teenage ghost only. <laughs> Dude, but like, at that point in my life, I just wanted to have a boyfriend, but my parents wouldn't let me until I was like, you know, a senior in, in uh, high school. And then, by then, I didn't want to have a boyfriend. Just how the universe works. But yeah, I remember reading this and I was just like, oh my god. I want a boyfriend like Carter. Oh my goodness. Okay, but yeah. Like, I read this and I'm just like, oh my god. Like, I'm, like, reliving my teenage, like, romance, angst, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I was lying down, but that made me dizzy. This was all too much. I felt myself start to blush, so I raised my arm, intending to cover my face. Carter grabbed my hand and held it. Our eyes slept together. You aren't the person you try to make people think you are, he said, sounding as though this had just dawned on him. I feel safe when I talk to you. My heart could have exploded. Lexi? I grabbed my hand away and sat up as fast as I could. Carter sat up too and raked his fingers through his hair. Five feet away, Still and wordless as a statue was Casey. Is something wrong with Dad? I asked. She shook her head. Then her gaze moved from me to Carter. What are you doing? She asked. Case, you remember Carter? I said. Carter stood up and held its and held his hand out to me. He pulled me to my feet and didn't let go. It's getting late, Casey said. She scowled, noticing our joint hands. Did mom send you? No. Anger rose up in me like a tidal wave. Go home, Casey. I'll be there soon. I'm hungry, she said calmly. Yeah, I'm hungry, she said calmly. So cook something. You'd rather be with him than me? Yeah, you'd rather be with him than with me? She said, 
her voice small and hurt. I'm your sister. Carter turned and touched my shoulder. Go on, he said. We can continue this another time. I shook my head, more out of disbelief than protest. I could have strangled Casey. Do you want me to drive you? Carter asked. Thanks, but we'll walk, I said. I couldn't risk exposing the only good thing in my life to my sister. What if she started talking crazy in the car? Stories, dolls, stealing stuff from school. Oh, maybe she'd steal something from Carter. That would just be fantastic. I turned to Carter and felt a smile fight its way onto my lips. Walk carefully. Walk. Yeah, walk carefully, he said lightly. Then he bent down and kissed me on the cheek. Ah! That was so dreamy. Then he bent down and kissed me on the cheek. That's for the nice things you said. I didn't even... Can we go? Casey interrupted. Walking home is going to take forever. I don't care if she's totally lost it, I thought. I'm going to murder her. Bye, I said. Casey had started walking away. Good to see you again, Casey. Carter called. I looked at Casey to see what she would do. She turned and glared at me, not even notice, not even glancing at Carter. Nice. I ignored her the whole walk home. I was done trying to help her if she wasn't going to try and help herself. After making a sandwich, I went straight upstairs and locked myself in my bedroom with the stereo turned way up. An hour, a half hour later, I heard Mom's voice on... I heard Mom's voice from the hall. Alexis? She called. Are you all right? Why is your music so loud? I went to the door and opened it, then went back to, and sat on my bed. She wandered in and sat next to me. I switched off the music. How's Dad? He's fine, she said. Maybe you can stop by after school tomorrow. I'll try. Are you feeling sick? She asked and put her wrist against my forehead. She drew back in surprise. You have a goose egg. I know, I said. Someone had knocked me down at school yesterday. Seeing the concerning look, yeah, seeing, seeing the concern, yeah, seeing the concerned look on her face, I added, not on purpose, with the door. Her brow wrinkled the way it does when she's worried. They didn't even call. They didn't call me. It wasn't that bad, I said, and thinking of Carter made me smile. Okay. Okay, Mom said, apparently not interested in the details. Let me know if you want something for it. You don't have a fever. I think we'll lie down. All right, honey, she said. It sounded so alien to hear her say something so... Yeah, it sounded so alien to hear her say something mom-like. She stood up and awkwardly touched my forehead. Then she looked around my room. You're so tidy, she said approvingly. You must have gotten it from your father. Certainly not for me. True. She's pretty sloppy for a mom. Her eyes stopped on the bookshelves. What's with your yearbooks? She asked. I looked at the shelf where all of my school yearbooks, uh, from kindergarten up, are stored. The last one, my freshman yearbook, was missing, was missing, causing a whole roll to lean at an annoying angle. It's gone. One's gone, I said. Odd. My thoughts flashed to Casey. It's not lost, is it? I almost heard an accusation in Mom's voice. Like it's, like I'd sold it for drug money or something. Wait, let me say that again. 
It's not lost, is it? I almost heard an accusation in Mom's voice. Like I'd sold it for drug money or something. Well, technically, I said. But I'm sure it'll turn up. She sighed. Those things cost a fortune. Just as I was about to reply, a cell phone ring blared from across the hallway, and Mom sprang up from and Mom sprang up off the bed. I'll be right back, she said. I sighed and leaned back, hugging a pillow to my chest and closing my eyes. A couple minutes later, Mom came out of her bedroom saying, Okay. Oh, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yes, please do. She clapped the phone shut. Yeah, she clapped the phone shut. Then she looked at me, but her eyes were unfocused. What? I asked. <clears throat> <clears throat> that was a detective from the police department, she said, fluttering, fluttering, fluttering her hands in the air. He said they have a reason to suspect foul play. They looked at the car's brakes, and the wires had been... It looked as if they had been cut. I sat up straight. Someone sabotaged Dad's car? Yes, but... She shook her head and lowered herself onto the mattress. No, Alexis. Not his car. Mine. He was going to drop it off to get my oil changed. I sat back against the headboard and looked at Mom. He was just staring down at the carpet. Oh my goodness, she said, her voice shaky. Listen, don't tell Casey about this. It would be too much for her. Yeah, I said, sure. Mom touched my forehead gently before standing up and making her way out into the hall, dazed. Thinking about Casey made me think about the reports in her backpack. Was it possible that the same kids who did that somehow came to my house and did this? Decided to pull a prank on her parents? If Mimi was mad enough about her arm, maybe she was part of the blame on Mom. Maybe she put part of the blame on Mom. But that would be, like, attempted murder. Even the most obnoxious 8th grader wouldn't try to kill someone else's mother. Someone's popping some fucking shit and it's just some wank. Go sabotage! Oh my god. <laughs> the, the ghost imposter is trying to sabotage. <laughs> <laughs> the family. <laughs> oh my god. Casey, who's the imposter? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Even the most obnoxious 8th grader wouldn't try to kill someone else's mother. Unless... Unless she thought Casey would be in the car. A half hour later, the doorbell rang. Thinking it might be the police, I rushed to the top of the stairs and watched Mom open the door. It was just a, it was, but it was just a pizza delivery guy. Mom looked up at me. Are you hungry? I shook my head. <laughs> Mom looked tired. Her face was pale and her hair was tugged back in a sloppy bun. Can you get your sister then? <clears throat> Yeah, can you get your sister then? I swallowed hard, just as Casey bumped into me from behind. It was enough for it was enough of an impact to make me grab onto the wall. 
feeling a split second panic that I was going to fall down the stairs. Oops, she said. Mom took the peeps Mom took the pizza into the kitchen, and Casey took the steps at half her usual speed. Halfway down, she stopped and turned to look at me. What's your problem? She asked. Your friends are trying to kill you, I thought, but I forced my shoulders back and kept my voice strong. I don't have a problem. Listen, do you think we should talk to Mom about those reports in your backpack? Her hand squeezed the railing so tightly that the missiles in her neck seemed to tense up. No, she said. We on it. We what? Yeah, we on it. We what? She glared at me. I said no. It's done. Resolved. I took them, I already took them back to school. You did? She made an irritated noise. I'm not completely helps, helpless, you know. She took the rest of the stairs two at a time and slipped into the kitchen. I stared at her, I stared after her while my thoughts rattled around my head. Nope, don't believe her. I crept down the hall to Casey's room. Inside the only light was a faint slant of glow. Inside the only light was a faint slant of yellow spilling from the hall, illuminating a little display of threadbare rag dolls on the other side of the room. When my eyes had adjusted and the lumps of blackness had taken in furniture shapes, I looked around for Casey's book bag. <clears throat> I found it on the floor between the bed and the doll shelves on the far wall. And I crouched on the carpet. I felt as if dozens of pairs of eyes were watching me, angry at my trespass. The bag was unzipped and empty. It had basic school stuff. Pens, a couple of empty notebooks, the last two issues of Doll Fancy. No wonder she had no friends left if she read that stuff at school. But no reports. I stood up and surveyed the semi-darkness trying to figure out where she, sh she would have stashed them. I even remotely considered the possibility that she was telling the truth. And that's when I found my freshman year, and that's when I, and that's when I saw my freshman year book lying open at the foot of the bed. It was open to the page of last year's seniors, and Casey had made a red mark on one girl's portrait. Why would she do that? I turned the book so I could see it better in the light from the hall. And then the light grew narrower. <clears throat> Under my gaze, the door jerked a little, almost as if I had woken it up. And then suddenly, an inch at a time, it began to close. I grabbed the yearbook and the door slammed shut in front of me, closing me in the dark. Fear pulsed through me like flashes of light. I was paralyzed in shock, too frightened to even move, although some distant part of my brain was yelling at me, get out, and then came the worst part by far. For a split second, I thought it was my imagination, but I knew, I just knew it wasn't. A, cold, a puff of cold, wet air on my neck. The smell of rotten eggs. I yanked the door open, practically throwing myself at the wall across the hall. I hardly had time to look back at Casey's door before it slammed shut again. I ran back into my room, switched on my light, and locked myself in. After a few minutes, I caught my breath and sat down on the door, uh, and sat down on the floor near the opposite. Um. It. After a few minutes, I caught my breath and sat down on the floor near the wall opposite the door. I wanted a clear view. What was that? After a couple minutes, I convinced myself that I had overreacted. The cold air could have been caused by the open window, which would also explain the breeze that slammed the door in my face. The smell was just musty old dolls. I set the yearbook down on the floor and flipped through it. 
all in all, I saw probably eight girls whose pictures had red marks, just a little check mark in the corner of the photo. Some of them I didn't know, but a few I knew all too well. Pepper Laird, Megan Wiley, but Megan's was different. There was a big red X drawn through her picture. In all fairness, it would make sense if you thought I drew the X myself, but I didn't. My obsessive neatness pervades every aspect, every aspect of my life. I was the kid who hung Barbie's clothes on their little hangers at the end of every play session, then parked her pink Corvette in its space under the dresser. No happy face stickers ever snuck into any of my bedroom furniture. In my yearbooks, though, they represent some of the most miserable hours of my life are pristine. It was Casey, obviously, but why would she do that to Megan's picture? I mean, how would she even know who Megan was? And then I remembered the tacked on ending to my story from the basement. It wasn't late, but I felt completely drained. The previous two nights of Niagara sleep hadn't been enough to keep me going. Especially not when faced with little sister, uh, especially not faced with a little sister dabbling in vandalism and parents being targeted for assassination. After I brushed my teeth, I washed my face and put on my put on my pajamas. I went downstairs to check the deadbolt on the front door. It was locked. I checked the back door too and went through the kitchen to check the door that led to the side yard in the garage into the garage. This is where someone could have had, this is where someone would have had to come in to mess with one of the cars. Dad's car was parked in its usual spot. As I neared the door, I stopped short. There was a chain lock. No way could someone have come through the store. That meant that whoever had come inside had been through the house or a strong chill went through me, making my hands shake as I recalled Casey's dirty socks. Had my sister, in a last, in a last ditch effort for popularity, actually joined in on some twisted scheme to sabotage our mother's car? Had she come out here and open chain lock to let someone in? It didn't make sense. She insisted that she hadn't been in the garage. But then she ha insisted that she hadn't been in the hallway that morning either. I trudged upstairs and closed my bedroom door behind me, hesitating for a split second. Shh. I opened my eyes to keep. I opened my eyes to see Casey sitting on the edge of my bed, luminous in the blue moonlight. Shh. She repeated. Casey, I said. What? Behind her, the door gaped open into the dim hallway. Hello, Alexis? Casey whispered. I saw you in the dark. What are you talking about? In the low light. Everything seemed drained of color, like it was happening in black and white. Ghost vision! Ghost vision! Yeah, in the low light, everything seemed drained of color, like it was happening in black and white. Even Casey's eyes shone bright black with flecks of white, but she didn't answer. Now, now I was wide awake. What do you want, Casey? But her attention had wandered away from me. I followed her gaze to my desk where the yearbook lay open. Why did you draw in my yearbook? I asked. She ignored the question. Come play with me, Alexis, she said, 
and her eyes burned even brighter. Come play, come outside and play with me. Nope. <laughs> yeah, nope. That's, that, that's not Casey anymore. That's not Casey anymore. Can look that <laughs> it's right dip the fuck out. Oh yeah, totally. I would I would not nope never nope. Yeah. Come outside and play with me. Are you crazy? I kept my eyes on her monochrome I kept her eye I kept my eyes on her monochromatic face and Reach my hand out toward the lamp on the nightstand. I don't want to go outside. I switched the light on. She ducked her head away, but I swear, for the split second I saw them, her eyes were green. Get away from me, I ordered. She stayed hunched over, facing the door for a few seconds. Then she turned around and looked at me through blank eyes. Blue eyes. What is that? I, I asked. Some stupid contact, contact lens thing? She seemed puzzled. No, Lexi. I have 20-20 vision. Go to bed, Case. Why did you want me to come in here? She asked, looking around. Was she kidding? What are you talking about? I didn't want you to come in here. It's the middle of the night. She slumped and leaned away. Her hand brushed the back. Her hand brushed the hair back away from her face. It was a gesture of elegance, practiced and casual. Then she reached out to my arm. I'm leaving. Bye. I'm leaving. Bye. <laughs> Not having this ghost shit kill me. Oh yeah. Yeah, she slumped and leaned away. Her hand brushed the back. Her hand brushed the hair back away from her face. It was a gesture of elegance, of elegance, practiced and casual. Then she reached out to my arm. Her fingers brushed my skin. We can be friends. She whispered. I felt a sharp burn and looked down to find four red marks across my skin where she'd touched me. You know what? I said. I'm sick of this. Get out of here. Casey stood up suddenly, grabbing the yearbook from my nightstand, threw it at the wall as hard as she could. What? Then, with hard eyes, she backed away and hit herself in the face. It took me a moment to process what I was seeing. My sister with an angry red mark on her jaw. And by the time I realized what she'd done, she was huddled on the floor screaming at the top of her lungs. A second later, mom came in, bleary-eyed. She looked at my sister crying on the floor, and then up at me, and the look on her eye in her eyes sent a chill through my body. I sat in a ball on the far corner of the bed. I couldn't find any words to explain. Mom reached down and touched Casey on the shoulder. Casey looked up at her, the red mark on her jaw getting brighter with the second. Mom and I both gasped at the sight. Casey, Casey, Mom whispered, kneeling down to get a closer look. My sister huddled down tight. Yeah, my sister huddled down tighter and shied away from my from mom's hand. Mommy, mommy. Uh, Casey sobbed. What, baby? What happened? Mom cooed, putting her hand on Casey's back. Mom, I said urgently. Mom held up her hand, and I knew there was no use. There would be no baby for Alexis tonight. 
Lexi hit me, my sister said between choking sobs. Mom took a moment to study the mark on Katie's face, then looked at me, and then looked up at me. She's lying, she said. She did that to herself. To herself, Mom repeated. That doesn't make any sense. And she threw that book at me. And Casey added. Mom glanced over the yearbook, which of course had fallen open on Megan Wiley's page, displaying the scribbled red X over her picture, her picture perfect smile. Mom, can we talk about this? I asked. Alone? Mom looked up at me. Mom looked up looked up at me incredulously. You don't understand, I said, even though I knew it was useless. She didn't believe me. Not in the slightest. You're right, Alexis, she said. I don't understand. Don't be mad, Mommy, Casey said. Lexi knows she oughtn't to hit people. She's just sad. Do you know what kind of day I've had? Mom exclaimed. Alexis, I know you're angry, but you don't have to take it out on your little sister. I didn't say a word. Casey and Mom stood, and Casey linked her arm her Mom's. Can I sleep in your room tonight, Mommy? She asked in a pitiful voice. Mom's shoulders slumped. She sniffled and nodded. I felt a pain in my chest. She's lying. She's lying. I said as they walked out. Mom didn't turn around, but Casey did. And her, eye, and her green eyes flashed at me as she closed the door behind herself. I sat down on my bed and pulled my left sleeve up to look at the marks on my arms. They looked like a really bad sunburn, and they were tender to the touch. Could a person really snap as suddenly as it seemed Casey had? One day be nice, one day be a nice normal girl, and the next be a total maniac? Unless Piper Laird had been telling the truth and Casey had actually broken Mimi's arm on purpose. Maybe she hadn't snapped all at once. Maybe she'd been getting worse all the time. And then somehow it had come to a peak in the past day, breaking down after dinner, stealing the reports from school, exposing all my photo paper, and having something to do with what happened to Dad. The Numbers on my digital clock glowed, glowed blue. 2.41. It was the middle of the night. I had to spend four more hours in darkness with a crazy sister in the house. I lay awake, staring at the ceiling, listening for any sound that might mean Mom was in trouble or that Casey was coming back. But I didn't hear anything, and eventually I faded, I faded into an uneasy sleep. And that is the end of that chapter. And I think this will be the last chapter. It's a pretty long chapter. But I don't have time to do it. We have an hour to do this chapter. <sighs> okay. <clears throat> One last chapter. Alright. This chapter is called chapter. Let me just think. Okay. Yeah, chapter 15. The next morning, I heard Casey bumping around in her bedroom, humming, but she, but she never came out. I grabbed a cold Pop-Tart and a Coke, and I was almost out the front door when Mom appeared at the top of the stairs. How great would it have been if she'd say, if she'd said, let's clear the air, Alexis. We'll sit down in the dining room and you can tell me your side of the story. But of course that didn't happen. 
she stared down at me. You don't believe her, do you? I asked. I don't know what to think, she said. I only know what I saw, and I know what your sister is, and I know that your sister is terrified of you, Alexis. Casey's not terrified, I said. She's just a really excellent liar. Then I saw my sister. She appeared behind Mom, moving silently, cat-like, and glowering at me, arms folded. <clears throat> Maybe we just need to have a look. Maybe we just need to have a talk about it. Mom sighed. Forget it, I said. Maybe later. No, Mom said. I don't want to forget it. I want to resolve it. Ghost steps. Ew. <clears throat> I don't want to forget it. I want to resolve it. From where I stood, it felt pretty darn resolved already. She'd made up her mind. I scooped my school bag off the ground and opened the door. Don't you dare walk out of this house, young lady. Mom yelled after me. But I did, and she only followed me as far as the foyer. I'm sure she spied out the window as I started down the street, but I didn't want to look back and check. <clears throat> My early departure got me to school super early, so I sat on the stone bench in a deserted corner of the co corner of the courtyard. Carter's car wasn't in the parking lot yet, so and I didn't feel like talking to the Doom Squad, who were monopolizing the picnic tables and their usual lively discussions. Uh, hold on. Yeah, Carter's car wasn't in the parking lot yet, and I didn't feel like talking to the Doom Squad, who were monopolizing the picnic tables with their usual lively discussions about manga and uh, manga and local bands, everyone trying to hog the spotlight from everyone else. I wondered if anyone would notice if I just sat there alone on that bench in that corner for the rest of high school, but eventually I got up and headed toward homeroom. When the bell rang, I started to think I might get through at least a class or two without incident. And then the classroom door opened. Casey waltzed right in as if she did this every day. A couple of people who knew she was my sister glanced at me. Mr. O'Brien, the teacher, looked at her curiously, but then, but just then the morning announcements began over the loudspeaker. Casey stood perfectly still, not even seeming to breathe, watching me. The teacher looked at Casey expectantly, probably thinking she was a freshman with a message from the, from the office or, or another teacher. Ghost breathe. Breathing? Breathing? What's breathing, Chandler? No. What's breathing? What's breaking? Everyone count that. Every now all of YouTube knows of ghost breaking. Swing for me. <laughs> oh cool. Nice. Thank you for clearing that up. thinking she was a freshman from the... Ugh. <clears throat> yeah, probably thinking she was a freshman with a message from the office or another teacher. But, she, my, sis but my sister didn't move. She just stood there. I stood up and went to Mr. O'Brien's desk, positioning my body so that Casey couldn't see my face. That's my sister, I said. What does she want? He asked, craning his head to look at her. I moved to the, I moved to block his view. 
she should probably get to class. Um, I said, she's not a student there. He looked at me, puzzled. I searched my head for an explanation, but couldn't find one. I'll be back in a minute, I said finally. I grabbed the hall pass from the chalkboard ledge and walked past Casey into the hall. She followed, and I heard my classmates buzz as the door swung, um, swung closed. <clears throat> I kept walking until I got to the parking lot. Then I spun on her, my arms folded. What, Casey? Mother made you an appointment with the psycho, psycho, psychologist? I said, Mother? You mean mom? Yes, she said, not even blinking. I am not, to, I am not supposed to say anything. I am not? I repeated to myself. Oughtn't? Mother, what was with the strange speech? Of course, that was pretty much the least of my worries. No, that, that should be like your top, one of your top worries. If someone comes out with strange speech that you've never heard them speak or utter from their mouths, you should be, you know, concerned. Yeah, of course, that was pretty much the least of my worries. She was so calm. That was the weirdest thing. My neurotic, scaredy-cat little sister, standing there, watching me with eyes as smooth and untroubled as a fresh blanket of snow. So mom thinks I'm a criminal? That's not news. Casey glanced down at my arm, squinting a little in sun. The marks from the previous night were hidden under my sleeve. That's not the only thing, she said, smoothing her shirt and looking away into the distance. She watched me from the corner of her eye. What do you mean by that? I asked, wanting to reach out and shake the coolness out of her. I mean, she's going to find something tonight. Yeah, I mean, I mean, she's going to find something tonight, Casey said. I didn't answer. Something that will make you look very bad. Like what? I had no idea what she was hinting at. Suddenly, I caught a glimpse of the school security guard making his rounds in the distance. I put my hand on Casey's shoulder and steered her away toward the gym. She didn't resist or even look up at me, just walked beside me as if we were taking a nice sister and stroll. I looked down at her again as we rounded a corner that hit us from the security guard. What are you trying to say? You don't want to get arrested, do you? Yeah, you don't want to get arrested, do you? Casey said, Casey asked, her lips working hard to keep from smiling. If you're trying to scare me, you're going to have to be more sp specific. I said. I'm just saying, she said, shrugging. Just don't be surprised if this police show up. The police? Ghost accusation. <laughs> so scary. <laughs> the police? Is this because of what happened to Dad? She smirked. Do you know who's responsible for that, Casey? Yeah, do you know who's responsible for that, Casey? She shrugged. Was it someone you know? Her smirk twisted into an ugly smile. If you know anything about that, you need to say something, I said. Oh, don't worry about me, she said. I stared at her. Casey, I said slowly, what exactly is mom going to find tonight? The, the security guard appeared. You young ladies need to get to class, he said. Especially you, Alexis. Yeah, yeah, 
I put my hand on Casey's shoulder and began walking again. But you can prevent it, she said. Prevent what? The attempted murder charge, she said. I took a staggering step away from her. Just start minding your own business, Alexis, she said. That is all I ask of you. We stopped near a set of double doors, the entrance to the gymnasium. I glanced back toward the halls of classrooms that Casey had inside. The banquet trappings were gone. Instead, we found a silent shipyard of boats for the next day's parade. We drifted through the rows, Casey steadying each, each float. You need an old priest and young priest, J-Sap. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, the, banqu the banquet trappings were gone. Instead, we found a silent shipyard of floats for the next day's parade. We drifted through the rows, Casey setting each float. She finally stopped in front of the one that was draped in white plastic sheeting with red with giant red cardboard shooting stars all over. A long wooden beach was built. Yeah, no. A long wooden bench was built on either side, so the sponsor club could sit and wave at, and wave at the bystanders. Running through the middle, between the benches, was a small forest of ar artificial Christmas trees. Some still with bits Uh, yeah, running through the middle, between the benches, was a small forest of artificial Christmas trees, some still with bits of leftover tinsel on them. Casey stared, entranced. What are you doing? I hissed at her. Pardon? A voice asked, and Megan Wiley came around the front of the float. Oh, perfect. Is this your flow? Is this your flow? Uh, Casey asked, her voice flat. Megan glanced at me and then smiled down at Casey. Ever the diplomat. Yeah, it is. Well, it's cheerleaders. Are you going to watch the parade? Casey shrugged, then wandered away for a second, staring at the decorations on the side of the, of the trailer. Megan and I were left alone, but I was too busy watching my sister to look to look at Megan. Finally, Casey came meandering back to us. Well, have a good day, Megan said, and through her pristine politeness, I could tell she was ready to be done with the competition. She turned to look at the float. I will keep a special lookout for you, Megan. Uh, Casey said, her eyes locked on Megan's profile. Suddenly, an image popped into my head, the yearbook photo with a giant red X through it. Oh, good. Thanks, Megan answered, turning to Casey with a cheery, I'm, with a cheery, I'm nice to dumb kids smile on her face. Then, almost as if she'd seen a monster standing there instead of my little sister, Megan's smile vanished, and she took a shaky step backward. Casey's innocent gaze never faltered. Megan touched her hair self-consciously and shot me a bewildered, questioning glance, almost like I'd said something out loud. A moment wobbled between us, and then I shook it off. Come on, Casey, I said, grabbing her arm. I'm sure Megan has more important things to worry about. I have to go, Megan said abruptly, then, and then disappeared around the other side of the float. As soon as we were out of the gym, I turned to my sister. How don't you dare, I said. Whatever you're planning with the police, who put you up to this, Mimi? Casey smiled brightly. I must go, she said, and turned around and started walking away. I followed her. 
Casey, I said. She stopped, but didn't turn around. I had to circle around in front of her to see her face. I mean it, I said. See you after school, she said, resting her hand on mine for... Yeah, resting her hand on mine for a split second before I backed away. Then she stepped inside and walked, and walked off past me. I didn't turn around. I didn't want to watch her go. Something moved next to the gym and caught my attention. I looked up to see Megan Wiley hover, hovering, almost hidden around the far corner, watching me. No, watching Casey. I turned and found myself face to face with the security guard. His name is Hal. Yeah, his name was Hal. I knew him too well. I'm sure he felt the same about me. Hey, you're bleeding, Hal said. I looked down at my hand where Casey had touched me. It was a mess of shallow cuts. Oh, that, I said. I have to get back to homework, and I walked away. My mind ablaze with these latest horrors. I did what any high school student does in the face of a major crisis. I went to class. At first, uh, yeah, first, second, and third period were fine. Apart from my aching hand, the nagging fear of what would be waiting for me when I got home, and the feeling that everyone was staring at me. Pretty much the usual. I tried to pay attention to the classwork to keep my mind off of prison and the idea that Casey might be planning to, you know, frame me and get me thrown in jail. No way could I talk to mom about it. I debated going to Mrs. Ames, but I didn't think she'd believe me either. No one would believe me. It was unbelievable. That was my problem. But when I got to fourth period, who should be standing in the doorway but Megan herself? I saw her from all the way down the hall, searching the crowded corridor. I tried to mentally will her. Yeah, I tried to mental. I tried to mentally will her not to be looking for me. But she stepped into my path before I could get by. We need to talk, she said. No thanks, I said, trying to go around her. I mean it, Alexis, she said, her voice low. She grabbed my elbow and pushed me away from the classroom. I followed her into the little into the girls' bathroom where, where she spun on me. Something is wrong with your sister, I said. I mean, she said. Somehow I'd, ex somehow I'd suspected this was coming, but at the same time, I felt like she'd poured a glass of ice water on my head. She's acting weird, right? I looked at Megan. She really looked like the popular kid straight out of a Hollywood movie. Even her teeth were sparkling white. Not really, I lied. She narrowed her eyes. We've never been friends. Yeah, and I'm sure it breaks your heart, I said. Which is what a person like me was supposed to say to a person like her. In the movie version, that, at least. But right now, I'm telling you that something is definitely off with her. What's her name? Kaylee? Her name is Casey. My stomach turned. I expected her to say, Pepper Laird is right, and your sister is a psycho, and oh, by the way, she seems to be planning to kill me for some reason, as demonstrated by her strange behavior at the gym. Oh, and has she by any chance scribbled mo over my picture in your yearbook? Instead, she said, Please don't think I'm crazy. Why would I think you're crazy? I said. Ugh. Hold on, let me just uh, do something real quick.
sorry, I just had to do something. I had to reply to someone real fast. Uh, 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 where was I? Oh, okay. Instead, she said, Please don't think I'm crazy. Why would I think you're crazy? I'd been, I'd been there when Casey went all children of the poor on her. I saw a spark in her brown eyes that seemed to be a glimmer of hope. Alexis, I have a sense for this stuff, okay? All my life, I could tell when something was... Suddenly, I had a mental image of Pepper and Megan plotting against Casey. I mean, so what if Pepper was right? Maybe Casey was crazy. But... Maybe Casey was crazy. That was still no reason to re release the cheerleaders on her. Maybe Mimi and Pepper and Megan were working together, and the whole thing was one giant conspiracy. I'm sorry, I said. I don't really think it's your business that my sister is... that my little sister is eccentric. Eccentric? Megan said. She... she looked genuinely surprised. <clears throat> Alexis, your little sister is possessed. I had to put my hand on the sink to keep from toppling over into the grimy tile floor. Like ghost, demon, dark side, Voldemort, Megan went on. Has there been has there been anything strange going on at your house lately? I shook my head. Like weird noises or sounds or smells or pockets of cold or hot air? No! Stop! I cried. Although, of course, there had been noises, sounds, smell, cold air, all of those things. Has Casey had any blackouts? Has she... Megan went pale. Did she have something to do with your father's accident? What my sister does at home is private, he said. Oh, yo, I'm finally getting someone who gets it. Yep, finally I'm getting someone who gets it. What my sister does at home is private, he said. But I couldn't get up the energy to say anything else. I felt it, Megan said. Like, in my body, when your little sister was in the gym. To be honest, she was freaking me out a little. Maybe, maybe if she was, may, maybe, maybe if she really was serious, she could help somehow. Maybe she knew how to fix Casey. Or maybe she would just, or maybe she would tell the cheerleaders that she'd played a huge trick on me, and I fell for it, and I would be a total laughingstock. How nice for you. How nice for you. I'm going to class, I said, heading back, heading out of the bathroom. Megan matched my pace. You can't pretend you didn't see it, she said. <laughs> so shows what she knew. I could be a very good pretender. I got to the classroom, and I reached the door. She placed the flat of her hand on the door and held it shut. It could get bad, she said. She looked at me with her lips pressed together, her eyes wide and solemn, no trace of perkiness on her face. That's my problem, I said, not yours, but I want to help. You don't have to worry. I'll stop her. I won't let her hurt you. Ghost hunters! Oh, hell yeah, dude. <sighs> you don't have to worry. I'll stop her. I won't let her hurt you. Megan drew back, her eyes white. Hurt me? Whoops. Why would she... The door swung open. Megan had to jump back to keep from getting hit. 
Were you two thinking of possibly joining us? The teacher asked. Megan and I slipped through the aisles to our desks, but I glanced up and saw her watching me, and I knew our discussion and I knew our discussion wasn't over. After class I slinked into the library to avoid running into Megan. The librarian was engrossed in an, a romance novel novel. But I but as I walked past her desk, she looked pointedly at the no sleeping on the couch sign and then went back to her book. It wasn't that I believed Megan, but I just had to see for myself. I went to the bank of computers with internet access and did a search and did a search on possession. The, gr the screen went bright blue with a block of white text that said, Results restricted. Exorcism, exorcism, ghost, and poltergeist produced the same answer. Then I, won then I wandered through the shelves, completely unable to find any books that had anything to do with evil sisters. Finally, I went to the librarian's desk and asked her straight out where I should look for books about demonic possession. The look on her face clearly said that it was just what she'd expect from someone like me. We don't stock those books anymore, she said. Ever heard of the CPA? Concerned Parents Association? They're, they deem those subjects inappropriate for children. So you threw them all away? No. No, we didn't throw them away, she said, sounding exasperated. Then can you tell me where they are? No. I guess she expected me to give up. So when I stood there and waited for an explanation, she sighed. Look, I don't want the CPA breathing down my neck again. They sent a mole in here last year begging to look at a book about witchcraft. Ten minutes later, I'm in the principal's office. Why don't you try Harry Potter? Please, I said. I'm a special needs case. You think so? She said, she asked, sounding kind of amused. She set her romance novel down and looked at me. So I was more interested, so I was more interesting than a book called Home is Where the Heart Is, a Darcy Sloan mystery. I knew she'd never believe me and that coupled with a mix, and that coupled with a mixture of exhaustion Exasperation made me bold. I pulled up my sleeves to reveal the burn marks on my arm. My little sister came into my locked room last night and did this to me, and she showed up here this moment, morning and did this. I showed her the back of my hand, the crisscross of, ra of razor fine cuts, amazed how matter of fact my voice sounded. Personally, I think she's just crazy, but Megan Wiley? The cheerleader? She, she thinks Casey's possessed by the devil, or possibly just a demon. The librarian sighed and opened her desk drawer and pulled out a book plopping in on the corner. How about this one? <laughs> I looked at the title. Cutting through the pain, helping teens who harm themselves. I'm sure this is I'm sure this is a very good book for someone who has difficult problems than I do, I said, pushing back to her. Then I left the library. Uh, then I left the library. When the bell rang, Yeah, when the bell rang and kids started, when, yeah, what, oh, hold on. Yeah. When the bell rang and kids began streaming through the courtyard, I looked for, I looked around for Carter. I felt a flutter in my stomach thinking about yesterday at the park. The heart is an amazing thing. Even on the verge of my entire life completely falling apart, 
I couldn't make myself stop thinking about how blue Carter's eyes were, how blonde his hair was, how much he knew about architecture. After a minute or so, I gave up and started down the hallway toward my locker to pick up my Spanish book. Megan Wiley was waiting for me, and not even ten feet away was a whole horde of cheerleaders. Great. Where were the police when you needed them? I would have handcuffed myself and jumped into the cruiser. I slowed down, hoping they would move on, but Megan just stood there. I decided that I'd rather brave Senora, uh, Senora Gregory's fury by showing up without my book than talk to Megan in the middle of the hallway. But when Megan realized I wasn't planning to stop, she walked over to block my path. She even put her hand on my arm. What did you mean when you said you won't let her hurt me? She asked. Megan, with all due respect, butt out. You're fooling yourself if you think, uh, you're fooling yourself if you think things aren't going to get worse, she said. I glanced at the cheermongers who were practice, who were practically drooling as they strained to hear what she was saying. Why are you so desperate to interfere in my? It, why are you so desperate to interfere with my life? I asked. But the thing was, secretly, I kind of knew I owed Megan an explanation. If she was in danger, didn't she deserve to know what was going on? But I was like a freight train barreling toward the end of the tracks. No turning back. And everything she said to, and everything she said scared me more. I'm only trying to help you, she said. She was indignant, not angry. Let me be clear. I don't want your help, I said. Our audience had grown. The between class crowd had stopped to eat to eavesdrop. If you would just talk to me for a minute, talk to you? I repeated. Oh yeah, because we have such a wonderful open relationship, I should pour my heart out to you. Anyone else would have walked away, but Megan didn't. She gritted her teeth and seemed to brace herself. Okay, Alexis, I'm sorry we're not better friends, but that doesn't mean I don't understand what you're going but that doesn't mean I don't understand what you're going through. Understand? I asked. I heard a murmur pass over the crowd, and I knew that this was a confrontation that some people in school had been hoping to see for a long time. I barreled, I barreled ahead. Sorry, this is a little more complex than spelling out words with your arms or getting your nails done. I somehow doubt that you, that you comprehend the problems real people have. <clears throat> For the first time, Megan noticed the gathered crowd. The gathered crowd. She lowered her voice even further and sounded genuinely confused. Why won't you talk to me? The thing was, just like with Carter and the architecture thing, I really did want to hear what she had to say. I just didn't want to hear it from her. Alexis's universe, Megan's universe. One is over here, and the other one is way over there. Completely separate. And that's how I liked them. But now Megan was stirring the pot. I'd seen firsthand the damage her clique could do. No way was I going to let them loose on Casey. Crazy or not. You guys already messed with my best friend, I said. Now you're coming after my little sister? Then, and then I thought of the perfect thing to say, the thing that would put Megan in her place, hopefully make her go away for good. I took a deep breath. I don't want to be your next victim. I know you think because your mom is dead that you have the right to say whatever you want, but please, leave me out of this. Leave my family out of this. Boom. Silence. Megan stepped backward and knocked into one of the kids who'd been watching us. 
Leave her alone. Someone said, and I assumed they were talking to me. A tall, lanky guy. The star of the basketball. Yeah, a tall, lanky guy. The star of the basketball team. And arguably the single most popular premiere in... Man, yeah, that is, that was, that's cruel. That's, that's, man, that's hard. That's harsh. A tall guy, a tall, lanky guy, the star of the basketball team, and arguably the single most popular boy in the entire school, took a step toward Megan. Lay off her, Wiley. He said, he looked at all of the cheerleaders and shook his head, disgusted. What's wrong? What's wrong with you? Could you guys just try to be human for once? Megan looked at him in disbelief. Then she looked at me. I hated myself. She still didn't look angry. Just hurt and confused, which only made me hate myself more. I just wanted to help, she said. Then she walked off, a line of girls trailing after her in defeat. The basketball player patted me on the back. Take it easy, Pink, he said, and walked away. The crowd in the hall hovered for a moment, taking everything in, and then dispersed. I stood alone in the hallway as I stood alone in the hallway as the bell rang, feeling totally numb. Then I felt a hand on my shoulder. Mrs. Ames. She looked down at me, a deep frown on her face. I need to see you in my office. And that is the end of that chapter. Oh, thank God. I was just like, okay, okay. Oh, oh excuse me. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I love you guys. I love my subscribers and non-subscribers that listen to me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you guys. I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.